All right. Thank you, folks, uh, for joining us for our final honors colloquium of the fall 2023 semester. Uh, it is my pleasure, as always, to welcome back uh, my once and future colleague, Dr. Ben Newman, who is a professor of biology and chief virologist at the Texas A&M uh, University Global Health Center? What was that? I don't remember what it's called. I, I should remember. Uh, but uh, Dr. Newman has been good enough for the last maybe five years or so to give us an annual lecture on viruses. Uh, so you've only got about 40 more to go. So you are almost, almost done, sir. Uh, but I will turn it over to Dr. Newman and we will then hopefully maybe have some time for questions by the end. Uh, but otherwise, uh, if you are joining us, keep yourselves muted until then so we don't get any distractions. And I will do the same. So, Dr. Newman, thank you for joining us. My goodness, thank you. It is great to be back. All right, let's put this on. And sure. Okay, there we go. Yeah. It rotates this time. That's the uh, big technical improvement uh, this year. Yeah. So hi, welcome. Let's talk about uh, all things coronavirus. And uh, I don't even know what this graphic is. I think it's kind of meant to be a coronavirus, but it's pretty cool. And I think that's the uh, main attraction here. So let's go. All right. First, I'll give you a little bit of where we are. And then the work we're doing right now is to try and figure out First of all, what makes a coronavirus a coronavirus? And second, are coronaviruses actually special? Are they like more dangerous? Are they better at something? Or are they just an annoying thing that happens to have happened to us? And, uh, you know, it's just a sort of a one off. Uh, so let's go. Let me get this little bar out of the way. There we are. <clears throat> all right. Here's your history lesson uh, for our historian. Uh, this is how the virus was growing and evolving. And what happens is basically when there's no selection, the virus just fans out. And so that's what you have here. This is time. And you can see the virus just fanning out into all these different types. This is your alphabet soup, alpha, beta, gamma, delta, all the cool ones. Vaccine one comes in right about at this point. And vaccine one actually hits all of these. And then you can see as people are taking the vaccine, all of the old strains go extinct, which is really cool. And then we've got our second doses uh, coming around here and around here. And we've got our second version of the vaccine. This is the, um, sorry, back up one. Uh, please. Uh, there we go. <laughs> um, the new version of the vaccine hit things like BA5 and BA4 really hard. And you see those branches go extinct. Now they go extinct a little slower because the uptake of that version of the vaccine was much lower. It was like 17%, one seven of the US. And then when you finally get to uh, the present day, we've got a new vaccine. The vaccine does hit all of the orange and yellow things, but the CDC won't even release numbers on how many people are taking this. They're still collecting the data. And I think the numbers are real small. Um, so there is a thing that works. And the nice thing is we are pushing the virus out of its comfort zone each time. But the virus is responding and changing, and it's still around. So yeah, can we keep pushing it? Can we push it off the edge of a cliff? That would be great. Yeah, just like in a cartoon. All right. So if we go back a step, all this happens because when life hands you viruses, what do you do? And these are some of the viruses related to coronaviruses that life has handed us. They're in all these weird bugs and creatures and every single thing that's a ladybug. Apparently those are all the same species, which is fairly ridiculous. Yeah, that's not how I learned it. And we got leech viruses now, which are fantastic. We've got coral viruses, sea anemone viruses, all your little crabs and critters of the ocean, uh, even an oyster. Yeah. And they all have stuff like Corona and the axolotl, fantastic animal right there. Uh, and even aquarium fish, earthworms. So you're closer to a Corona-like virus than you probably think you are. Even if you're in a room with somebody, uh, yeah, you may be uh, especially close right now. But there are a lot of these things out there and they get around. Yeah, these are things that we hadn't noticed before. And so these are all new viruses. So let's have a look at these. So... Where do we get these viruses? Well, it's from this crew right here. Um, and 
if you had to make a band out of these guys, can you can you spot who they would be already? Bottom row, these are uh, managers, production team, definitely. You got your lead guitarist. Look at Humberto up there. Is that a lead guitarist photo? Gemma on Vox, obviously. Reese, bass guitarist, if I ever saw one. Chris is going to drum very precisely. He's from Germany. Yeah. Um, there's even one of these viruses that we found during a class at Texarkana and uh, found by Dondre Burris. I looked for a picture. I can't find a picture. If he's out there and doing well, tell him I say hi. That was pretty cool. Yeah. Uh, he found it in this uh, frog, which has an unusually wide posterior uh, and like pointy little head. Very strange little frog. But hey, you take the viruses you get, not the viruses you want. Yeah. All right. Part two. Let's go to the aquarium. Ah, soothing, relaxing. Look at the little fish dance around and whatever they do in the water. But as we're looking through these fish, we start finding that, oh, here's one. So the little tiger barb, did you have one of these growing up? Yeah, we did for a while. They were kind of aggressive, like a bit bitey. Um, they turn out to have a coronavirus uh, inside of them. So that's pretty cool. And this is a legitimate coronavirus, one that's Close enough that it, there's at least a reasonable possibility uh, it could jump to something. Maybe not to you. Yeah, and don't kiss your tiger barbs, but because uh, <laughs> they bite. Yeah, among other things. But yeah, could definitely get around a little bit. We found them in beta fish. Aren't those lovely? We've got two different viruses in there. And uh, it's like Dr. Seuss viruses, the Leto and Pito viruses uh, are kind of close to each other. And they're both so far only in uh, fish and one amphibian. Then this <laughs> slender looking, wow, what a fish. Uh, so that's a loach, and it's got a Nangosha virus in it, in addition to a Tobani virus. Both related, Nangosha comes from the Nanhai ghost shark virus. That's a ghost shark. Ghost sharks are pretty weird looking. You'd also hear them called uh, chimeras, very deep uh, ocean, kind of primitive looking fish. Just weird, yeah. Looks like it's wearing its skull on the outside. Uh, and then you got this guy. This is Cinnabosha. Um, and so they gave me a data set that had a Cinnabosha virus. And as I was building it, it appeared to be branching several times. And it turns out we were able to reconstruct four different viruses, but they all came from the brain of one fish. Yeah, that's a lot to think about. Four different kinds of coronavirus. And as we're finding all these things, we're starting to realize that, wow, there's a, a ton of this stuff out there. So all these uh, uh, white lines are some of the new coronaviruses from various fish. Um, you see the uh, the tiger barb is right here next to Takifugu. Do you know that one? That's the uh, puffer fish, the fugu, uh, the Japanese one. You eat it and then maybe you don't die. Yeah, <laughs> that's certainly more adventurous than my lunch today is uh, ever going to be. And that's OK. Yeah, we all make choices. <clears throat> So it's not so much a fish tank. It's like a filthy cesspool. It's like the Watchmen comic where they're all locked in there together. But it's like, no, you're locked in here with me. It's not that I'm in here with you. All these fish have their own viruses. We cram them together because it looks pretty. And then they're just spewing these viruses out. And where's the virus go? It goes up the filter, it goes back down the filter, and it goes into one of the other fish. And then all of a sudden, you got Cinnabosha with four different viruses in its brain. Yeah, really cool stuff. All right, look at those little waggling spikes. So this is to remind me to say, hey, what are the spikes of these viruses doing? And it turns out, well, here's a neat thing about spikes that uh, we just learned. So coronavirus, it has this spike and it has a little domain, like the thing that it actually uses to bind to you. And they just, they're sometimes up and sometimes down. It's like thumbs up, thumbs down. This one, though, is a different coronavirus, HKU1. You had this at a baby, and we figured out when you put this little molecule in, look what it does. Oh, my gosh. It opens all the way out. So it bumps into a cell. It picks up a little sort of tickle when it's close to a cell. That sugar locks into the pocket, and then, bam, this thing Swiss Army knifes itself out, and now it's ready to enter. Yeah, ready to party. So, yeah, spikes are neat. Um Anyhow, what we found is a filthy orgy of spike swapping nonsense going on here. So what we've got are two trees on either side over here. Whenever you see a straight line across, that means the spike has stayed. And the evolution of the spike is just like the evolution of the virus in general. When you see crossing over here, that means that one of these viruses 
was in the same tank with another one and actually stole its spike. And the thing we know is that if you swap out the spike from one virus to another, it'll get into a whole different set of cells, whole different set of animals, and you get a whole mess of unpredictable trouble coming out of that. One of the neatest viruses on here, let's see if we can find it. There's one of these with two lines branching out, and it's actually picked up two different spike proteins, which is, oh, there it is up there, hypomesis. Uh, it's the like fifth or sixth one, sixth one down from the top. Yeah, that one stole a spike and kept its own spike, as far as we can tell. Just really bizarre behavior. But if you have two spikes, you can maybe get into two different cell types, two different animals. You are just better at uh, dealing with whatever whatever life's going to throw your way. All right. So it's not just a fish tank or just a filthy you know, cesspool. It's you know, a fish tank after dark. They're swapping spikes all over the place in there and recombining in ways that are very hard to predict what the consequences will be. So there you go. Here are some of the genomes, and we like to color these things so we can find all the little parts. And so you can organize it in three sections. There's this big bit at the back that just doesn't change at all. And these are the important enzymes that can't change. And then you got this chunk right here from the brown all the way up to the light blue. And that's stuff that's going to help the important enzymes work. It's all their little entourage and accessories and stuff like that. Then you got the front end, utter mayhem. Yeah. This is the stuff that the virus uses to basically mind control the cell, shut it down, make it think it's not infected, and in fact, make it increase production of virus. Like maybe that's what you want to do. Very Jedi mind trick. And you get something different in every single virus we find. Even though these things are related to each other, this is the area where they just chop and change absolutely at will. So... When we were doing this, this is a great meme, uh, we were trying to figure out, so how do you actually show this? We've got all these different things and we think they're the same, but if you want to put them all on a family tree, you have to demonstrate mathematically that each one of these is the same. So we've got 17 domains, that's like the different colored boxes, we've got 23 viruses, so it's a couple hundred total, but then some of them are partial genomes, so we're missing some things. And this is what the results look like. Yeah, doesn't that look fun? Yeah, for the holiday season, you got your eye melting green in there. You got a little bit of red and you just got some really cool decorations hanging over. I don't know what this is. The numbers we like are uh, kind of the second number, the E value uh, number that's over there um, is probably the best one. So what we came up with was inspired by your childhood, if you're of a certain age. Yeah. <laughs> so there used to be these candy companies and they made a thing called candy buttons, possibly the worst candy with the coolest look that ever was. Yeah. I think they're just sugar. I never bought them, but they were always there. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so there we go. This is our super duper heat map. And so each one of these is a virus, a domain, combination, and the hotter they are, the more certain we are that these things are actually definitely related. And so it turns out that, yeah, basically everything with math can be demonstrated to be definitely related. Um, and you can see the ones that we're missing part of the genome. It doesn't mean those parts aren't there. It just means we didn't pull out a whole fish uh, when we were fishing this virus out. We just got part of it. What do these things do? Well, wow. They make a couple of really big machines, and they are the basic machines that make the virus work. Um, you got your, it's like a little pore, it's like a little channel, a uh, little tunnel to, yeah, I don't know, Mario's sewer. Uh, it's where the virus is going to grow on the inside of this and then export brand new copies of itself out. Um, you've got a protein that's going to process this into little tiny units that can all go do stuff. You got the super complex RNA making machinery, and you got a little thing that helps it to hide from vertebrate immunity. All right. So that's the equipment that we have now. When Norman Rockwell is done with a painting, at least I assume when he's done, uh, he's going to sign it. And so you got your little signature right down there at the bottom. Yeah, good style. When coronavirus is making its RNA, it does this weird thing where it actually kind of signs it. So it puts the same little tag. It's about 70 nucleotides onto everything that it makes. Um, or just like one of those annoying little watermarks in the bottom corner of a YouTube video. We ought to get one of those for the honors program. Yeah. So the virus does that. And so the question is, well, all right, how? When did it uh, invent this? 
And you know what? If we were in class, we could go through all of this, but we're not. This is like a voluntary lecture right before Christmas. You've got an early version of the polymerase. And the neat thing is there are these little sequences. And every time it runs into a sequence, it's young, it's distractible, it, its mind wanders, it looks out the window. Some of the time it just stops and then it leaps up and it puts on the extra little bit. That last little bit, the little peach bit at the bottom is like the little tag, like the little signature. And depending on how many of these little gates it gets through, it'll either make the full genome or various little smaller versions of the genome. It's just like unpacking your suitcase when you get to the hotel room. Then later, once it's made those little tiny copies, the polymerase matures. Once it's mature, it stays on the straight and narrow. It does not deviate. It carries on and it starts and completes everything that it starts. It's basically boring, an adult, yeah. Um, its youth lasts about 15 minutes for the uh, virus uh, polymerase and then its adulthood lasts about 45 minutes and then that copy is just broken and it's gotta make a new one. So when did coronaviruses learn how to do this? How did they learn how to do this? How can we tell from looking at little tiny made up viruses that we pulled off the computer? Well. If you take actual virus from a real human being, what you'll find is that it's going to do this. And so there's going to be uh, very few copies of the whole genome. This is like from the start of the genome to the end. But every time we get to another gene, there's going to be twice as many copies because there's the little one that stopped at that gene. And so you'll see a little step just like that. And then every time you get a gene, you get a little step, 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 step until you have the full complement. So that's the unpacked virus. And that means it's actually there and working and doing stuff. And you'll get a big spike right here at the beginning. That's like the little signature part. We call it the leader. So this is a coronavirus in this weird little thing. It's a delta smelt, I think is what they call it. And you see the little steps and each of the steps is right where one of the genes starts for this thing. Um, but there's no step at the beginning because this one does not put a little leader on. So it's a coronavirus that just doesn't do the, honestly, it's the one thing that coronaviruses were known for. Yeah. And it just blows it right out of the wind, right out of the water. All right. Here's one of a little uh, mole looking thing. It's called a Zocor. Yeah. And uh, this little guy has just sort of badly sequenced RNA, but you can find all the little jump spots and it does put on a leader. It's a kind of a short leader, but it, it there, it signs its work. So this is a coronavirus that does. Yeah. All right. So that's good. Uh, and then we go through and we find that it's just chaos out there. There are corona relatives. We went to all the different ones that we found and some of these have the little steps like this little bug virus. Uh, it's a little ocean swimming copepod. And uh, David Allard like copepods, I think. Uh, they, uh, they have the steps, but they have no leader on there. So, okay. They've got some that have the steps. So they only make one step and they do have a leader. You can see that little bump right here and we can find the reads from it. And they have another one that has 10 different, uh, there we go, 10 different uh, possible stopping points. Nine of them, it stops and doesn't sign it. One of them, it stops and it does sign it. Why? I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> that's a weird way to run a virus. Very weird way. And in looking at more of these, it looks like basically anything is possible. Uh, anything goes in the world of coronaviruses. Although we see that they do group up. So if this is the family tree, you would expect, you know, if the ancestor did it, you know, this way, then the kids are going to do it this way as well. And so you've got the primitive way where we don't sign our uh, subgenomic RNAs, our little RNAs. And then right about here at yellow dot land, we've got where we do decide to do that. And then there's one family branch that decides, heck with that, we're not going to do it anymore. Um, but they definitely branch at this point in the tree. And so, yeah. Uh, that's kind of interesting that they've uh, developed this new tech and it's spread pretty broadly. And then they've also uh, decided to chuck it in. Yeah, there were some branches that didn't need it. That's a lot of change. Viruses don't usually change the fundamental way that they work. So next thing we can do with all these different crazy, you know, bug viruses and leech viruses and yeah, coral viruses we can spot all the things that are there in every single one of them. And so uh, those are all marked here, just a couple of the boxes. We can spot the things that are there in some of them and not there in others. And we can make a great big, it's like a matrix. So here's a little picture of it. I zoomed all the way out of the spreadsheet. It's like hundreds and hundreds of columns and rows. And we can mark each feature as being present or absent. 
So this is like how you would make a family tree, but we're doing it with entire machines, entire units that make up part of the virus and probably make it somewhat dangerous. Because the idea is, if you can spot the points where the virus starts to evolve really fast, and then you can see, well, what machinery were you using when you started to do that? Then you ought to be able to come up with a pretty good answer for, all right, which parts of this virus, if any, make it a little more dangerous? So first thing we got to show is our coronavirus is actually different. This is a coronavirus exceptionalism uh, section of the talk. Um, so we'll start up here with the boring viruses. Picornaviruses include polio, which your grandparents knew about, but it's not a big deal now, and things like the common cold. There is a little airborne version of something very like polio that either kills you or paralyzes you. There's not much of that, thankfully, but uh, that's one that we're watching. Um, and so what we've done is colored each of these branches based on how much evolution has happened on the branches because you can see how long the branches are, basically. The, that's a thing you can do. So if they're dark colors uh, all the way to black, that's the lowest evolution. If they're hot colors uh, all the way to yellow, that's a lot of evolution, like super fast. So picornaviruses, there are lots of these. These are the most numerous viruses that we know. They're in everything. Like every insect has several of them. <laughs> uh, it, yeah, just some of them haven't been found yet. They barely evolve at all. There's extreme diversity, but they don't change, which means they probably can't change. Then we've got these two branches. So on your way to uh, uh, Nidovirus town, like coronaviruses, you got this branch up here, and then you got another branch coming in here, uh, this bottom branch. Next branch, look at that. They're all sort of blue. They're all medium evolution branches branches. And we just found a bunch more of these. They're all in spiders. Yeah. I don't know why, but this entire group is very spider centric. Um, down here is a group that is mostly insects, but there's one kind of, uh, it's a little mite, uh, which is like a kind of related to spiders uh, that gets this. And then look, once we get to actual things like coronaviruses, look at those yellows and greens. Coronaviruses evolve fast compared to other viruses. Like really fast. Yeah. <clears throat> and here are the graphs that actually show it. So here's uh, sort of the uh, substitution rates for each one of these hundred or so picornaviruses in purple. Here are the two intermediate groups halfway to corona. And here are the actual things that include corona. And uh, if you plot them out uh, on a nice little uh, graph like that, you can see, yeah, they leave these other virus groups in the dust. Um, so Nidoviruses, very fast evolving viruses. Probably that's going to be a thing that makes them unpredictable. For one thing, it's going to make them able to get around problems that other viruses can't get around. We can vaccinate against polio because polio is a picornavirus and picornaviruses can't pivot. Yeah. Coronaviruses really, really like to pivot more so than any other group of viruses that we've seen. And we can only make these conclusions because we found so many relatives of coronaviruses and darned if they don't all have a lot of the same machinery uh, behind them and the same outcome. So which parts are important? Because we've got various intermediates that are all related viruses and they come up to uh, the coronas or like the super duper future virus. Well, it turns out it's this clump right here. And they're not the things that I would think. Yeah. So in this clump, the middle part of the clump is actually only found in viruses of vertebrate animals. So it's powerful, but it's only something you need if you're dealing with a creature that has an immune system. What this does is it's a little trimmer. If the virus has a little piece that's hanging out, there are a couple of proteins in the cell that will detect it and will sound the alarm and shut that virus down. This one just checks any nucleotides that are hanging out and it just trims the virus back, gives a little haircut. Once it does that, the virus becomes basically invisible to the cell. So that's pretty cool. But these are things that you only have in vertebrate animals. So every single bad vertebrate animal virus definitely has one of these that we found. Um, the thing that I think is probably most responsible is this little nub uh, of NSP14. It's known as a proofreading enzyme, but it also turns out it's a pretty important recombination enzyme. Whenever the virus is adding that little signature, it absolutely depends on this proofreading enzyme 
because it gets to that little signal and it doesn't just dawdle and wander and, you know, <laughs> walk off into the weeds. It actually makes a little bit and then deletes a little bit. Then maybe makes a little bit and deletes a little bit. And then eventually it gets to just the right spot and it can jump and add the signature part on there. And it looks like that may be the same mechanism that lets it bump into, let's say, a messenger RNA from you and say, well, maybe I could copy that. Maybe I could add that to the front part of my genome where anything goes, the Wild West region. And so that's the one that looks as though it's most uh, related. There is one group of nidoviruses, corona-like viruses, that doesn't have this domain. And that group have really short branches with really little evolution. Now, there's one virus in there that does cause hemorrhagic fever, like bleeding out your eyes, uh, but in monkeys rather than people. Uh, so it's you know <laughs> not completely benign, but it is kind of painted into a corner. It probably would have a hard time changing. And so far it hasn't jumped to humans. So, you know, yeah, thank you lucky stars for that one. So is this the Achilles heel? Yeah, of a coronavirus? I don't know, nobody's made any drugs that target this particular thing. And yeah, yeah, pull that arrow out, man, yeah. <laughs> so there you go. This is how the coronavirus subgenomic RNA got its leader or whatever you wanna call it. It's a just so story. Uh, lots of people uh, helped out on this with uh, giving me uh, interesting viruses to play with. And of course, this is a guy who definitely would have been here. I don't even know if he liked viruses, but darn it, he showed up. And there's something to be said for that. Um, so that's all I've got for you. How can I help? Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you, Dr. Newman. Um, yeah, I agree. Dr. Allard would have uh, would have been happily here um, to, you know, to talk about viruses. Um which is unfortunate, but uh, we have a bit of time, about five or 10 minutes or so for questions for anyone that wants to uh, to either drop them in the chat or unmute and, and ask them. So not all at once, it's one at a time. Form an orderly virtual queue. It, it sounds like uh, we should be very concerned I guess, I mean, so much of this is way above my head and I, I'm not, you know, I'm not a biologist, so I'm not a librarian, but it just sounds, uh, should we be terrified or should we be like our evolution has saved us so far, so we're we're doing okay. I don't know. <laughs> I'm not sure what to, what to take about. I think we should not be surprised when the next coronavirus comes up. I think this is our enemy and I think we're going to be in a struggle with coronaviruses forever but it'll be different ones because it's going to keep doing different things but the really hot branches of the coronavirus tree with the longest changiest things are all in the ocean they're all beaten up on crabs and you know yeah shrimp and stuff like that right now so there are plagues definitely happening in other parts of the ecosystem that kind of go yeah uh, unnoticed until it makes the right change and, you know, uh, yeah, jumps back and hits some other kind of species. It's rare when it does that, but Corona is more equipped to do that than any other kind of virus that we know of, which is kind of cool. Yeah. No dianomy. Yeah, that's all. <laughs> that's the thing. You and I have different definitions of cool there, Ben, but that's okay. Uh, Drew, Drew has a question. I saw a news report about a week or so ago about a new respiratory illness in China that was kind of freaking people out. Is there any indication that's another form of COVID or one of the early responses was essentially it was just flu and people had been, you know, chatting and getting together in ways that they hadn't been? Uh, do you have any tea leaves on that? Yeah, it looks as though it is just the regular virus getting into an kind of under immunized population. The vaccines they've got are not as good. And because of the trade war thing, I don't think we're sharing the RSV vaccine. So it's an RSV influenza uh, coronavirus uh, triple team. There was that one year here where they seem to be sort of syncing up and then they've broken apart and they're a couple weeks off their peaks. It looks like it might be that. Um, so far, they haven't reported anything interesting. But I mean, sitting over here in Texas, uh, to some extent, I know what you know. And uh, yeah, I think a lot of people uh, set up and uh, took a sip of their coffee and thought, huh, I wonder what that's going to be. Yeah. Thank you. Hmm. <clears throat> 
Um, how important do you believe that vaccination is going to be in halting the evolution of the virus? For example, like with polio, measles, influenza, that were previous pandemics that had obviously high mortality rates. Those were mostly solved with vaccination. And we can see with measles nowadays, as well as with polio, now that there is the anti-vaccination strategies, those viruses are starting to resurface again. So would vaccination be an effective mechanism to prevent the further evolution of these coronaviruses? Probably. Is that going to change the situation? I don't know. I wish it would. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you're absolutely right. Um, the more you pummel these viruses, every time there's some there's natural selection uh, and immunity is like a giant part of natural selection you get a virus that sort of sneaks out the back while everybody else is being destroyed and it's usually not going to be the best virus of the bunch it's going to be some random virus like you know repopulating the human species after an apocalypse random um yeah not is probably not a busload of olympians that actually you know are the ones that survived um, so there is an idea that the virus actually is forced to get worse in order to get around immunity. And so, like you're saying, it's a thing that we probably could do. I don't know if it would ever be quite as effective as the polio vaccine, just because you're hitting kind of a stationary target with uh, polio. It would probably be more like the flu vaccine, but during COVID, we managed to just, well, we extinguished a couple of branches of the flu family tree and really cramped down the others. And uh, yeah, I, I think we'll find out what it could be if we ever do it. And I don't think the world is in a place where we can actually do it right now. And that's a little depressing, you know, to know that we could, but aren't. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Good question. I mean, mm. I've asked it myself. <laughs> yeah. Welcome to my world as a historian, by the way. Pretty, pretty much what we've been doing. What? what? Surely people have learned from the mistakes of the past and don't repeat <laughs> them anymore. Surely. I read something about that. Yeah. 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 It's, it's a fun, it's a fun bit of fatalism. Um, any last questions before we uh we release Dr. Newman back to this his college station all locations? Hey, you used to get that nice dip and those little crackers if you showed up for one of these things. Yeah. Yeah. yeah we uh we still we still have light refreshments. So these days we've moved mostly to cookies and coffee. But um anyhow, all right. Well, thank you once again, Dr. Newman, uh, for your um uplifting <laughs> look at current research on viruses. Uh, as we head into the holiday season, uh, we will see you again in about a year's time, I suspect. Um, if not before, hey, you're always welcome to do these on a weekly basis if you wish. But uh, all right, thank you, Ben, appreciate it.